Welcome back to Bluegrass on this rainy November day. I'm out with Herman, about a five month old German short hair pointer puppy. And uh, today we are gonna compare and contrast Herman, this German short hair pointer puppy, with Cora, a five month old yellow Labrador retriever puppy. Uh, the reason I'm making this video today is I made a video last week where I kind of compared a lot of different breeds. We went on a big adventure and quite a few people sent me an email and they were saying, hey Stoney, that, uh, that video was awesome, but could you isolate the comparison between the short hair pointer puppy and the Labrador Retriever puppy? So that's what we're going to do. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with my channel, uh, what I'm doing right now is uh, old hat, but to, for those of you who are not familiar with my channel, is when dogs come here, uh, we integrate them into a system. Part of our system is to teach dogs very simple basic obedience and a very simple vocabulary. Okay? Uh, the vocabulary that we use is come, let's go, hup, easy, wait, and stay. And we want to make sure that that vocabulary can be implemented in a wide variety of situations and environments. So when we're teaching that vocabulary, we teach it on what we call the exercise of small challenges course. Now, one of the things I want you to notice right off the bat, first point of comparison, is Herman, he's been here for a few weeks, and notice how still that he's wanting to rush ahead through his formal schoolwork. So we have a formal training portion of the day and an informal, okay? So we come out here, we work on our basic obedience, and then once the dogs have imp showed improvement from the day before, then we move on to informal training, or what we call learning by doing. That's where we head out to our pre-adventure area, and once the dogs are good at hiking in our pre-adventure area, we go over to our farm for big time off-leash adventures. Okay, so Herman has gotten to the point to where when I bring him out, he's very aware that once we get finished with this formal section of our training, that we're gonna go do fun stuff. And so from his point of view, if he rushes through this aspect of our training day, then we're gonna get to go do what he wants to do faster. Okay, it's very similar to having a smart child who wants to rush through their math homework right like everybody knows that you should like do your math homework and check your work to make sure you have the right answer but smart kids oftentimes will just kind of know the answer and they're not sure exactly how they got there and uh, they'll rush through their they'll, they'll rush through their homework and then they don't establish a good foundation the same thing happens when you have a, like a smart athletic uh, versatile hunting dog or bird dog. This dog's plenty smart, plenty athletic, he's got great proprioception, but you can see as he's standing here, you see how his nose is going up and up and up and he's looking, you can kind of see his head darting around. What he's doing is he's seeing all these different leaves like move around and that that movement is causing him to like like lose concentration on me a little bit. Not to mention Okay, that my neighbors have horses and cattle and geese and all kinds of stuff. And so this, this uh, wind that's coming towards us is bringing all those scents. When you, when you buy a dog that's bred to run away from a handler okay, and look for game or, or birds and wait for the handler to pick up with them, then guys, you can't get really upset that they don't seem to have focus in, in what they consider boring obedience exercises. Okay? Now, to get around that, like if you're training a short hair, you can make your obedience exercises a little bit more enticing in the young, uh, in the early developmental stages. So like if I, you know, if I come out here and I want to work with Herman and I want to hold his attention, I still have to sweeten the pot with Herman quite a bit. And we'll take a look at Cora and we'll see if I have to sweeten the pot quite as much. Now, as a, you know, as a general rule, the dogs that are bred to do a job, a complex job in conjunction with a handler, okay, they're going to be a little bit more pattern cognizant, they're going to be a little bit more easy to, to keep on track, they're going to be um, quite a bit easier to build attention span and impulse control, and the dogs that were bred to do a job but not closely in conjunction with a handler, like this dog who's bred to run away from a handler, find a bird and then a handler comes and finds him, they're going to have more trouble with like your traditional basic obedience exercises. Is that, a, is that a plus or a minus? Well, it's a minus if you think about like doing obedience exercises is the kind of stuff that you want to do with your dog. It's a plus, and you'll see this when we go hiking, if you like having a dog that's obedient enough, but it's really fun to go you know, hiking with because it does like a lot of interesting things on its own. And this dog doesn't need me, doesn't need me to be involved to have a good time. You know? But you can see him rushing through here. Now again, watch if I go back to a little bit faster reinforcement schedule where I kind of keep him interested. 
Now this is going to be something that you're going to notice with the Labrador Retriever is that with a similar amount of training, okay, I do not have to reset the Labrador Retriever's uh, attention span oh, as often as I do the short hair pointers. Wait. Go here thing to you. Very nice. Good. See, once I'm, you know, once I decide that we can make the game a little bit more interesting for Herman, once I can, you know, bring my benchmarks back a little bit, okay, kind of like sh show him some reinforcement points in this routine, then he kind of stops forging because this activity starts to look a little less boring. Not a lot less boring, but a little less boring. So if you think in terms of total time commitments when you're doing training exercises, especially if you want to integrate food work protocols into your training, well then you're going to have to extend your time horizons uh, if you're working with uh, a short hair or a similar, you know, kind of what they call a versatile hunting dog. Very nice. Basically, a versatile hunting dog is bred to take the place of a whole kennel full of other dogs, right? So they can kind of do what a pointer does. They can kind of do what a retriever does. They make a pretty good house pet, okay? But they, they don't do any of those things as well as a dog that was bred specifically to have those traits and tendencies. So they require a little bit more work, a little bit more patience, and uh, a little bit uh, kind of longer time horizons in terms of developing well-established habits. Very nice. So all in all, he's a very good dog. Okay, so now we'll take him off the leash and we'll walk out here in the field. On the way to the field, I'll recall him to me a few times and then I'm gonna throw a retrieving item so we can just kind of take a look at his natural inclination to retrieving. Okay, so he's gonna get out here and every so often, I'm gonna call him, ask him to come check in. Comes checks in, I say appreciate it. Now the dog's relation to me in terms of distance, okay, this is gonna really be something that I think you'll find is quite a bit different between the lab and the German Short Hair Pointer once we go out back to the adventure area. It won't be super obvious right here, but definitely be on the lookout for how the dog's movement looks in relation to me, like how far he ranges before he comes back and checks in. So I'm just gonna stand here for a second and we're gonna just see how long it takes for him to come back and check in. He knows what we're gonna do. I do the same thing every day. He's gonna come over here and I'm gonna throw a retrieving item and then we're gonna see kinda how he does. Around here we use what's called an inductive retrieve uh, and it works on pretty much all dogs that have retrieving uh, drive of any type. Uh, but the point I wanna like kinda make to you if you're thinking about getting a dog is that you cannot count on retrieving as a reliable way to exercise your dog uh, to the point of fatigue. Okay, in other words, you'll hear me say a lot that uh, a tired dog is a good dog. That's true, um, but the best way to make sure that the dog is tired is to take them out and go on a good adventure, go on a good walk where there's uh, lots of activities, lots of mental and physical stimulation. Because a lot of people, they'll, they'll email me and they say, well, Stoney, I'm gonna get a lab, or my buddy's got a German short hair pointer, and he plays fetch with him until he's tired. Guys, that's a very small percentage of both labs and German short hair pointers, okay? And that's a, something I wanna make sure that you understand. So this dog's kind of run off. He's kind of doing his own thing. I'm going to call him back. Come on. If he comes back. Now I'm just going to take, now I'm not really working on a formal retrieve here. I'm just kind of showing you guys the dog's natural tendencies uh, in relation to each other. So I've got my retrieving item. He is excited about this. Some of these German short hair pointers are fetching machines, but it's a small percentage and it kind of is, um, uh, very bloodline specific. But that same thing holds true with labs. A lot of people believe that labs are all good fetchers when in, in truth uh, a very small maybe one percent of labs are really good fetchers. So I'm gonna throw my retrieving item. I'm gonna ask him to bring it to me. I might have to bend down. Okay and this is what we get most of the time out of these young short hairs. You see he went over there he got it He's possessed it. He's probably going to come up here. He might give it to me because we've been working on it a little bit, but most likely he's going to run and get up here kind of close and then play bow and try to get me to chase him. Come on, Herman.
Come on, dude, you can do it. And I wish that you guys could see this on the camera, the way he's side-eyeing me, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, like, we just build on this, uh, and every day, <laughs> as he starts to develop attention span and impulse control, we'll, you know, get a little bit closer to having, uh, you know, something resembling uh, a good retrieve. Hey, come here, nerd. Come on. Come on. Come on, you can do it. Oh, you can do it. You're a very good dog. Now, this, look, see, right here. He brought it kind of close to me, so I'm going to reward him and say I appreciate it. The key aspect of doing the inductive retrieve, guys, is patience. You have to have a lot of patience. Very nice. It's hard to believe they sell you guys when labs are available. Come on, fetch it up, nerd. Okay, all right. So you kind of get the idea, all right? It's fixing to rain pretty hard, so uh, we'll run in and grab Cora, and then we'll head out back so we can get some good uh, hiking in in the rain. But uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what a uh, you know, typical short hair puppy with about um, you know three weeks of uh, formal training under his belt looks like in terms of leash manners, uh, proprioception, focus, attention span, and uh, retrieving. Okay, now I'll go get uh, Cora and we'll uh, compare and contrast, and uh, then we'll head up back. Good dog, come on. All right, so I went in and he grabbed Cora. Cora is a nice five month old English Labrador Retriever, a show type Labrador Retriever, and she is a very good example of that type of dog. Uh, now, as we're walking the course, I want you to think about, and you might even rewind the video there and, uh, and, and watch Herman, and look at the difference in terms of the dog's overall focus and ability to stay on task, okay? For the most part, dogs that are bred to do a complex job in close conjunction with a handler are going to be a little bit more pattern cognizant, they're going to have better attention spans, and they're going to have naturally better impulse control. That's why you see uh, dog trainers all the time choosing uh, herding dogs and retrievers uh, for their demonstration dogs. There's a reason they don't choose Great Pyrenees. Okay? So as we're walking, okay, you'll notice that Cora kind of seems naturally more compliant. Okay? And that leads us to the conversation of like, you know, does this dog want to please and Herman just not want to please, or is Herman hard-headed? I think it's really unfair to put labels like that on versatile hunting dogs or bird dogs. You know, like the dog, you bought the dog, the dog didn't buy you, and if you bought a dog that has natural traits and tendencies to move away from a handler and let the handler come and find them, then you can't really get aggravated with them when they try to move away from you or they're easily distracted. I mean, if a bird dog wasn't easily distracted by birds, he would just hang out with the guy with the gun all day. Easy. Now, a retriever is supposed to hang out with the guy with the gun all day until something really super duper extra fantastic interesting happens. And then they're supposed to run out to that fantastic interesting thing, grab it and bring it back and say, look boss, what I found. Okay, easy. So it's not that one of the types of dogs is hard-headed and the other type of dog is not hard-headed. It's just that, uh, you know, selective breeding, uh, you know, uh, determines personality, it determines uh, physical type, and it uh, determines uh, behavioral traits and tendencies. Good, very nice. Good, easy. One of the things I want to draw your attention to is with about the same amount of training, look at how little I'm having to use the leash with this retriever, okay? Now, if you watch my videos a lot, you'll see me doing this, where I take this finger and I just kind of let the leash drape on my finger. Well, what I'm doing there is I'm testing the dog to see how much leash pressure it needs to perform the task uh, required of it during our formal training exercises. Every day, I'm trying to get to where I use less and less leash pressure, okay, because that lets me know that I'm closer to reliable off-leash behavior. Let's go. There's a lot of people today, come on nerd, there's a lot of people today who would have you believe that reliable off-leash training is somehow or another tied to gadgets. Well, it's not, guys. 
Reliable off-leash training comes from reliable on-leash training. And of course, easy. That's a whole lot easier with dogs that are bred to stay close and uh, work in conjunction with a handler. Good, very nice. Hup, come on, come on. Very good. Wait. Good. Easy. Oh, you a smart dog. Fine animal. Very nice. Good girl. Now, about this part of the course, you, you might remember, I had to go and start really doing a lot of clicking and treating with Herman, okay? Because, like, Herman, <laughs> he gets bored with schoolwork. I feel him. Back when I was in school, I was bored all the time, you know? And if school would have just been, like, structured a little differently, I'd probably, you know, I'd probably be a doctor. I wouldn't be making uh, some dog training videos, okay? Uh, so... When you, when you are thinking about getting one of these types of dogs, one of the things I would like for you to think about is how your school is going to be structured. You know, what kind of dog training are you comfortable with? What kind of dog training uh, options do you have in your local area? And if you don't have someone in your local area that is familiar with a particular breed of dog, okay, listen, you might, uh, even though you want the dog, you might say to yourself, I'm going to wait till I'm in a little better position. Easy. Very nice. Very good. Now I'm going to break out one treat here because Cora's still been struggling with this exercise a little bit. So you saw that I had to use treats consistently with Herman, like on the whole latter half of the demonstration. And with Cora, I used one treat. Okay, And I probably didn't have to, but I wanted to get a really good uh, repetition there. Very nice. Sit. Stay. And probably the next time I'll use treats is when we're out in the field and I'm working on the inductive retrieve. Very nice. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna take her leash off. Now I want you to watch as we walk out in the field and see, you know, how Cora stays close or doesn't stay close and then compare that to Herman. <laughs> Now typically, like, this is very important for you to understand, like let's say you're going to go hiking, when you get out of your car, if your short hair is not on the leash, he's gone. He's not going far from his point of view, but it might be far from your point of view, right? 50, 60, 70 yards in the parking lot at your local, you know, national park, that's a long ways, and he could very easily get run over. Uh, generally speaking, you let the lab out of the car, and it's just going to kind of make circles around the car, and it's going to look for, for you, and he's like, come on, Dad, come on, Dad, come on, Dad. So it's a difference between, hey, come on, Dad, let's go hiking, and, hey, Dad, I'm going to go over here, you follow. Okay, the big difference. So as we walk out here, I'm going to kind of try to maintain the same posture, uh, same vocal inflection, not going to get too excited. Again, I'm not working on a, a formal retrieve. I'm just going to kind of toss the item, and we'll see how Cora responds. So I've got a retrieving item out and up. Very nice. Now you guys know I use an inductive retrieve. Very nice. Now even though this inductive retrieve is working very well with Cora, Cora does not come from a bloodline where she has just a tremendous amount of retrieving drive. So you can't just count on using retrieving uh, to exercise Cora. She's the type of lab that needs lots of attention and lots of walks, lots of varied activity during the day. If you want a dog that you can specifically exercise, even a Labrador Retriever with, with, with the retrieving, you have to buy a dog like No Name or Annie, you know, one from Field Bread Lines that are just kind of crazy about retrieving. And that's, listen, there's not very many of them, okay? Less than 1% of Labrador Retrievers have, you know, really, really good retrieving drive. <laughs> Oh, it's a very good dog. It's a very good dog. Very nice. Okay, all right. So, there's a good uh, comparison, couple comparison points for you. Basic obedience training at the, about the three week mark and a little bit of retriever training at about the three week mark, although it's not formal retriever training, just kind of seeing if we can get them to, to like fetching. Okay, now we're gonna head out back and we're gonna go on a little hike and uh, you guys can watch um, how the two different dogs interact with the environment. All right, good job, Cord, come on.
All right, so now we're headed out back to our pre-adventure area, and we're going to take a little hike, and you guys can compare and contrast at your leisure. Come on, dogs. One of the first things you'll notice is that Herman is going to be in and out of the frame a lot. So probably for this next half hour that we're out here, uh, if I was to leave all of this in the, in the video, you'll see Cora uh, probably 85% of the time, and you'll see... Herman probably maybe 40% of the time because he just moves so fast that it's it's really hard for the cameraman to catch him you know with the with the with the camera come on dogs come on come on come on very good so here's Cora there comes Herman and you'll see sometimes he runs out ahead of us and he turns around and he looks at us like, come on guys, very nice dog. You're a very good dog. Oh. You see him already, nose down and he's off hunting. Now, Cora also will be nose down. She's just not going to go quite as far. And even if she wanted to go quite as far, she wouldn't be able to go quite as fast. And she's not going to be able to go for as long. Okay. So you hear me talk about energy rates a lot, right? I kind of have, you know, break it down into three factors. You got energy expenditure, endurance, and then recharge rate. These German short hair pointers, they have, they can get, you know, they discharge a lot of energy very fast. So their energy discharge rate is high and their endurance, man, they can go all day. And then a recharge rate, listen, we can go over to the farm and we can let these dogs, these German short hairs run all day. And then between the farm and the kennel, which is only 25 minutes, uh, they sleep in the truck and then we get, we get back to the kennel and they're like, let's go boss. You know, they're up and ready to go again. Now, one of the things that can be frustrating, like for you, you're trying to watch a comparison video and you're like, Stoney, I can't see the dog. Well, you know, how am I going to compare him? Well, uh, this is real life. If you're going to go hiking with a short hair, guys, and you're not going to have him on a leash, you got to be confident enough to let him go do some stuff, okay, and not panic because they don't respond well to people that are micromanagers, you know, and they don't respond well to people who, you know, put too much stress on them. You see, here he goes. He wasn't going too far. He's like, Stoney, I got it under control. I'm going to go a little ways, then I'll be back. Uh, for you guys that are familiar with like sports analogies, I guess, if you, if you think, think about it like a football field, like say the lab, you know, he's going to be from the end zone to the 50-yard line, right? He's going to be somewhere in that distance from you, okay? The German short hair pointer is going to be end zone to end zone. Okay. It's not that they're running away. People panic all the time. They think their dogs are running away. They're not running away. They're just going to what they consider a comfortable difference. And if you don't like that comfortable difference, then that's where your training comes in so you can set limitations on their natural uh, boundary zones. Every dog has kind of a natural distance that is going to go away from its handler. You know? And with the short hairs, that's consistently maybe 75 or 100 yards. But you can get them back pretty easy. Oh, there he is. Very good dogs. Okay, now you'll see that Cora has picked up a dog's favorite toy, right, which is a stick. And you notice that these dogs get along very well. Short hairs, uh, I, you know, I like having them at my kennel because they... They reliably get along with the other dogs. You guys know I love labs the most because, you know, they do the easiest things. And then like right there, cameraman was going to try to, you know, turn around and show you what those dogs are doing, but they're just too fast, you know. Now, if it was two labs, it'd be pretty easy because they'd be over here where I am. The short hair in this case is like ranging and and kind of pulling the lab out a little bit. But that also works in reverse, right? So the short hair would be ranging a little farther if myself and the lab weren't holding back. Okay, let me see if I can get them back here. Hey dogs, come on, come on. Very nice. You're a good boy. And you're a good dog. I like to selectively reward them uh, if they come back super quickly. Very nice. All right, now I'm just going to kind of stand still, cameraman, so you can kind of just keep an eye on the dogs there, see what they're up to. 
We see a lot of stick eating. This is another thing people panic about with their dogs. No reason to panic about that. They go through an oral stage where they like to pick up things and and if you don't let them, you know, if you kind of don't let them figure out what goes in their mouth versus what doesn't go in their mouth, you get yourself in trouble. All right, see what Cora's hunting over here? This is something that grosses all of you guys out. I mean, I see this in all my training journals all the time. Uh, Cora is over there eating rabbit poop, and that's pretty disgusting, I know. But, listen, who is to say what a delicacy is, you know? <laughs> uh, and that right there is real dog behavior. He wants to go over there and eat a little rabbit poop, and he wants to roll in some rabbit poop, and then grab a stick and come out and go to having a good time. All right, so, um, all right, let me see, cameraman. You, you can just swing around behind me here. Come on. Very nice. Very good dog. And this is what we're going to see all the time. You see, he's out in front. So short hair is that far away, and the lab's usually somewhere between me and the short hair. Very good. Very good dogs. Mind your way, cameraman. See, there he is, he's off hunting again. Comes, he looked at me like, hey, Stoney, we, are we going hunting or what? I'm like, yeah, I'm coming. And as soon as I start moving, he starts moving out. Cora. Very good dog. Herman, this way. Come on. Notice that it almost always takes me a little bit more effort to get Herman moving where I want him to, to go. It's not unmanageable, okay? It's not unmanageable at all. But ha being happy with a dog is about having met expectations. So you have to understand that it just takes a little more work when you have a dog that's bred to range a little farther and be distracted more easily. See, there he goes. A lot of times in my journals, what I'll see is people have a short hair and they'll be like, Stoney, my dog ran away from me today. And I'll be like, well, how far did he get? And they're like, 30 yards, you know? And, they, like, and I'm like, I think he was gonna come back. And they're like, I don't know, you know? Let's just kind of watch them for a minute. And see again, I mean, very consistent pattern. You can see the lab right now and you can't see the short hair. All right, and just when you think you've lost them, let's see if we can call him back. Oh, and here he comes. Very nice. Good boy. <laughs> but see, look, he came. He said, you need something? I was like, no. He said, well, I'm going. <laughs> and he's right back off. Now, if you can see him, if, can't, uh, you, if you can see him, like look, he gets up there, he finds something, there he goes, he waits, and he turns around, looks at us, he's like, come on guys, you coming? Very nice, let's see if he comes back, checks in, good dog, you're a very good dog. Then we try to let him get hunting. I'm trying to stay out of the way of the camera so you guys can see what he's up to. Oh, there he is. 
Come on, boss. And then here's trusty and reliable. You know, guys, I say it all the time. You know, like the Labrador Retriever, it's like the Honda Core, the Toyota Corolla, the, the Tacoma of the dog world. It's super reliable. Maybe not sexy, you know, but super reliable. And there they go playing. And see, that would be a wonderful shot. Maybe one of these days when I hit the lottery, I'm going to get like a cool camera system, you know, where you can like really track the dogs doing stuff. Because I know that's what you guys want to see. But don't even, don't even try. You're not going to get it. Come on, dogs. Maybe if I can get them up here on this little corridor that we'll be able to catch them playing more. Come on, come on. Now, over here, where we usually go down in the creek, there's a lot of usually interesting things right here. Again, nose to the ground, smelling, investigating, picking things up, testing it out with their mouth. You have to resist the urge to go, you know, hiking with your dog or to take them out for environmental socialization and try to micromanage this. This is things that they just, you know, they got to get out of their system when they're young. Okay, let's go this other way, cameraman, and we'll come back down through that brush a little bit where it's easier to video. Camera dogs. Okay, we're gonna go back up that way. Now you'll notice at different times of the years as you're watching my videos, that the dogs uh, kind of mouth on different things. That's because all that stuff tastes different and smells different, depending on the season. Come on, dogs. Come here so they can see you. Cora, Cora, come on, come on. Very good. Everybody wants to see your pretty faces. Very nice. Very nice dogs. Those are good dogs. Very good. Missed that. That was pretty interesting. He was just pointing something, cameraman. All right. Now, of course, all you guys that are familiar with my channel, you're wanting to know how they look on the world famous brush pile challenge. So we'll come up here. Go ahead and see. Well, Missed it. Again, that dog is just so in and out of the frame, it's hard to catch him doing all that fun and interesting stuff. I'll get up here with him. Herman, come on. We'll see how a lab and a short hair look when they're negotiating. World famous brush pile challenge. Oh, Lord, they look better than Uncle Stoney. A little bit slick out here today. Come on, Cora, you can do it. Very nice. They're a very good looking pair of dogs. Very good looking animals. Fine animals. You fine animals. Very good. Okay, now I'll go to the other side of the brush pile. Now you notice it's raining, so all this stuff gets, you know, pretty slick. Very nice. So I'm gonna head over here. It's a lot harder on this side. We can still see, oh, what they can do. Come on, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on. Very nice dogs. Very, now this is like more problem solving because you can see how that side of the brush pile is much more packed down than this side. See, I kind of fell down in this one. So 
this dog, maybe a little bit more athletic, maybe a little bit more naturally sure-footed. Cora, come on. Come on, Cora, you can do it. And of course, she's happy. She wants to give it a shot. Very nice. But watch her struggle a little bit with it. Very nice. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> you guys are very awesome. Y'all are making Uncle Stoney look pretty good, but why is your head in my food pouch? Okay, so we'll get out of here. Oh, okay. All right, well listen guys, it is uh, starting to rain quite a bit. And uh, that's gonna, that always plays havoc with our video recording. So we'll kind of stop this video right here. And that should give you, you know, kind of a starting point in terms of talking about a Labrador Retriever versus a German Short Hair Pointer. Uh, and since so many of you ask if I could isolate that, you know, if you, if, if there's something that I missed in this video before these dogs go home, you know, write it in the comments and I'll see if I can't rig up a little test so we can compare them or whatever metrics that you feel like I'm missing in these videos. Uh, and other than that, uh, I hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you guys next week. Very good dogs.